Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to talk about what I think is a fairly serious topic. And that topic is the video game Six Days in Fallujah. Now, it's not actually going to be about that video game, but instead about the responses to that video game, both across the game's journalism sphere, but also, a bit more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, in the games industry and developers and folks related to big-time publishers and game makers themselves. If you aren't familiar with this game, let's start out by talking about its history, at least a little bit. I've pulled up a Variety article entitled Six Days in Fallujah, a bloody Iraq battle and video game that almost was. And this is from 2018, so a couple of years ago. Before Call of Duty turned from a World War II series and into a modern military blockbuster, game developer Destineer, with studios in both Raleigh and Minneapolis, began crafting Six Days in Fallujah. Its dramatic interactive take on a deadly real-life Iraq battle mixed in interview footage from Marines who were there to accurately depict a recent wartime event. But things didn't work out. The project died. Or as Variety describes it, the Fallujah saga remains untold in interactive form because of political concerns, marketing fumbles, press pressure, and expensive development. Not all was wasted, though. In time, six days in Fallujah could still happen. Now, in terms of all that press pressure and problems with marketing, you can see some of those in some of the older articles from Games Industry Biz. I pulled one up here in which they talk about some of the complaints about the video game proposed. The massacre carried out by American and British forces in Fallujah in 2004 is amongst the worst of the war crimes carried out in an illegal and immoral war. There is nothing to celebrate in the death of people resisting an unjust and bloody occupation, etc., etc. And I think that is a fully worthwhile set of thoughts to have, that you don't like that this game exists, you don't like what message it is intending to portray, although it should be noted that this individual and the individuals we are going to talk about as part of this video haven't actually played the game in question or instead reacting to it before it even is out in the marketplace. But I have no problem with somebody saying these things. I don't like it. I think they're going to do it wrong. I think they're going to do it poorly. And I think the game's going to be bad and bad for the world. I have no issue with those particular statements. That being said, it went a little farther. And it went a little farther here in 2021. Here's a Verge article explaining that Six Days in Fallujah is back. Controversial shooter Six Days in Fallujah is back in development with a slated 2021 release date. Six Days in Fallujah, a controversial third-person shooter set during the Iraq War, is back in development over a decade after being canceled following negative feedback and controversy surrounding the game's premise. And I think it's actually a first-person shooter, but that's fine. To ensure this is the most authentic military shooter to date, Highwire Games announced on the official Six Days in Fallujah website that the development team had spoken with over 100 Marines, soldiers, and Iraqi civilians who were present during the second battle for Fallujah who have shared personal stories, photographs, and video recordings with the developer. So at least ostensibly, and perhaps in response to some of the complaints of around when this game was originally announced, they are putting in a lot of effort, again ostensibly, to get authentic responses from people that were involved in the battle and to actually put it in the game. If we go and we look at the trailer that was presented as an exclusive on IGN, you can see some of how the developers of this game intend to use that footage and those interviews to kind of present it almost as a documentary style. Reminded me a little bit of the game uh, Mafia 3, if you're familiar with how they did that with kind of the documentary juxtapositions of what was actually happening in the video game. Mafia 3, of course, being fictional and not presenting exactly the same kind of concerns as this particular game. Now, IGN had this exclusive. They have this full trailer. They have interviews. They have podcast appearances. And they talk about what might be an interesting feature for a game like this. They have procedurally generated environments to attempt to give you the feeling that you don't know what's around every corner as you play the game. Or as the developers say, memorizing maps is fake. It's that simple. Clearing an unfamiliar building or neighborhood is terrifying. You have no idea what's about to happen. And this is one of the reasons we experienced such high casualties in the battle. So if you are trying to depict it realistically and explain some or how the dynamics of the battle worked, makes sense to try to put that into video game development terms and potentially create something new, something artistic, something that in general we look for in video games. Now I'm going to be entirely honest with you. In case you think I'm tilted towards this game, I really am not. I wasn't that impressed by the trailer. I wasn't that impressed by the interviews that they put forward. I'm probably not going to buy this game. But I also don't think that it needs to be squashed out of existence, that it can be evaluated on its own merits, whether or not it has any after its release, and that 
attempting to create art and the depiction of things that were important in history is not something that should just be set aside out of hand. Again, the Six Days in Fallujah developers try to establish that they are really serious about all of this. The game was conceived by Marine, who was badly wounded during the battle, and more than 100 Marines and soldiers have helped during its development. Six Days in Fallujah explores many tough topics, including the events that led to the battles for Fallujah, what happened during these battles, and their aftermath. We do this during gameplay and through documentary segments that include interviews with many Marine soldiers and Iraqi civilians who were most affected by these battles. Players will encounter Iraqi civilians during gameplay as well as during documentary interviews, and players will also assume the role of an unarmed Iraqi father trying to get his family out of the city during certain missions. You won't play as an insurgent, they say. A portion of the proceeds from six days will be donated to organizations supporting coalition service members as well as Iraqi civilians who have been most affected by the war on terror. They're going to donate some of their proceeds. Now, again, I look at this and say, you can 100% read this fact watch that video, read that article from IGN, and think that this is effectively U.S. military propaganda. But it isn't the first time, and undoubtedly, it won't be the last. Call of Duty has a lot of those kinds of propaganda elements in and of itself, and is, of course, the popular one or two most popular games in any given sales year in the video game industry. It's also not the first time that things have been looked at specifically in the Middle East with respect to tactical gameplay and things along those lines. If you remember the game Full Spectrum Warrior, which was a game that was actually worked on in part by the U.S. Army and some of their uh, development teams, this game was, you know, okay. Uh, But it didn't spark the same kind of ire because 2004, 2005 isn't 2021, even though... Full Spectrum Warrior is far closer to the starting point of the United States' involvement in the Middle East. That is your background. Now we get to today, in which Kotaku, among others, starts saying things in commentary form, such as, you don't have to run the exclusive reveal for that war crime game. Rebooted War Crime Simulator, Six Days in Fallujah, got its official gameplay reveal yesterday in a new trailer that seems to confirm some people's criticisms of the game as a one-sided propaganda for the U.S. war machine. You're making a lot of assumptions here, Kotaku, right? As I said, I'm not particularly excited about this game. I don't think it looks very good. I think it's a little unclear that at present it's a war crime simulator or that anybody has been confirmed about anything from a six-minute video, large portions of which consist of video documentaries that are included in the game. So, you know, Kotaku's jumping the gun, but that's not too terribly unusual for them. You also see them reference things about this game that suggests that they are making their own case as to what the Battle of Fallujah was, much like we saw in those controversies and commentary earlier when the game was set to be released. As the U.S. military believes, many of Fallujah's men are guerrilla fighters and has instructed U.S. troops to turn back all males aged 15 to 55, the Associated Press reported in 2004. Iraqi stories and testimonials were obtained for the game, but will make up a much smaller portion of the game than the first-person tactics deployed by U.S. Marines. He described the invasion of Iraq not as a grave injustice with a staggering death toll, which apparently is the only way that Kotaku would have you describe it, but instead as controversial. Now, the problem with all of this, and Kotaku continues with everyone can and should interrogate how the game is shown, whether it should even exist, and what it ends up being. The problem with all of this is that it effectively allows for only one point of view. And I'm not saying you have to agree with the six days in Fallujah point of view. I'm saying that the standard that you take to a game of any kind or any piece of art, a TV show, a book, a movie, can't be that this thing shouldn't exist if it doesn't agree with my viewpoint on the topic in question. I'm not even saying Kotaku is wrong, and I'm not disparaging anybody that thinks they are right in the description of the Iraq war, the war on terror in general, the war on Afghanistan, whether any of this should be depicted in a fashion that it will be in this video game, but I am criticizing them for thinking that it would only be okay if it wasn't a celebration, if it depicted things only in the way that they would prefer to have it depicted, right? He didn't call it a staggering death toll and a grave injustice. He called it controversial, and that makes it not okay. It should be interrogated to not exist, which leads us to the reason I made this video. Kotaku is Kotaku. They're entitled to their own opinion, just as this next Twitter user is entitled to his. But we have to comment on how it came about. This is a tweet from a gentleman by the name of Osama Dorius, who says, 
please take the time to sign this petition to stop them making a game that intends to normalize and trivialize the murder of my fellow Iraqis. Please retweet and spread the word any way that you can. Don't let these monsters get away with this. That's pretty strong language. Let's see what the petition actually says. Here's the Six Days in Fallujah trailer. Stop Highwire Games and Victura from normalizing the mass murder of Iraqis. Victura and Highwire Games just announced the 2021 release of a horrific video game called Six Days in Fallujah that promotes the mass murder of Iraqis by American invaders. To add insult to injury, a demo of the game was circulated on the 18th anniversary of the Iraq war, an illegal invasion and occupation by U.S. forces and their allies. This was an intentional or this was an international war crime that included the mass murder of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and the displacement even more. Bombing, shooting, and humiliating the Iraqi people is being normalized in this sick video game, which again, just as a reminder, isn't out yet. And certainly none of the things in the trailer depict all of this, which will also inevitably breed a new generation of mass shooters in America and brainwash gamers into thinking racism is okay. This one video game, according to this petition, will inevitably, not even a question, breed a new generation of mass shooters and inevitably brainwash gamers into thinking racism is okay. Now that's a lot to ask of any piece of art, but certainly a not triple A, relatively independent made game that doesn't look all that great. That is incredible. And yet this petition is signed by a whole number of people. We get to the end here and I just wanted to highlight one last bit. Together we can stop this madness. It's unclear how, but we'll get to that. War is not normal. Video games that dehumanize brown people are not okay. American game developers have been creating sick games like this since the first Gulf War in Iraq in the 90s, normalizing the killing of Iraqis for the next round. This has to stop. That's strong words. War is not normal. And again, Osama Darius, entitled to his opinion, the First Amendment, freedom of speech, absolutely. And if that were all this is, I'd say, okay, petitions, change.org, certainly makes a lot of sense. But we then start looking at biographies. Osama Darius, at Osama Darius, lead game designer on Gotham Knights at WB Games Montreal. This is an actual game designer, a lead game designer by his own description. And who knows how accurate that is. We've seen various descriptions of various people get wrongly misinterpreted. Hopefully the Twitter bio here is a correct one that we can rely on. But it's a game developer, lead game designer of a game backed by a big intellectual property, which a lot of people are excited about saying, other game developer, you need to be banned from releasing your video game because I don't like the content contained therein. And I'm not saying you have to like it. I really am not. But I do think you have to be careful about when you are in an industry commenting on what other people in that industry should or should not be allowed to do. Of course, it only starts there. We see other references. That's my cousin. I remember her and I were once walking through Virgin Megastores when she noticed the game Desert Storm being sold. She then proceeded to rip the manager apart for even holding the game on their shelves. This was over 15 years ago. She's the best. Shouldn't be allowed to have games like Desert Storm. I have to admit now, in the interest of full disclosure, I very much enjoyed Electronic Arts' old Strike series. I believe they had a Desert Strike uh, game uh, that depicted fighting uh, in the Middle East, but of course wasn't as realistic as it is now. You see that this person is a designer, a community manager, a game developer. Continuing, I don't generally like to criticize fellow divs, but as you point out so clearly, the trivialization of horrific real events and the normalization of the murder of Iraqis can't simply pass without comment. I'm a manager community developer At Ubisoft Montreal, Ubisoft, the makers of such pacifistic and not at all violent games as Rainbow Six Siege, really anything with Tom Clancy on it, Assassin's Creed. Have you seen Valhalla? You do some damage in Valhalla. Now, nobody's going to go out there and be a Viking, surely, but you are 100% engaged in violent acts that come out of the Ubisoft stable of video game developers. Again, myopic, not seeing the forest for the trees. Signed, we need politics in games so things like this don't happen. I would argue that this game appears to be political. They don't appear to be political in the bent you would have them take, 
But there's no question that depicting a real life battle within the last 20 years or so is a political kind of conversation. Now, where is Ms. Kim from? Well, she's a senior designer at Respawn. Respawn, makers of such nonviolent games as Titanfall. And of course, what's on the top of their Twitter pinned? Their most recent release, a virtual reality game in which you go and you shoot up people in World War II. Now we get into really interesting questions that a number of people have asked on the internet, which is, okay, if Respawn developers are going out there, they have their own first person shooter in a war setting and saying this other company shouldn't have, shouldn't be allowed to have a first person shooter in a war setting. Aren't we talking about restraint of trade, anti-competition, things like that? The short answer is no, probably not. We'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end of the video probably not running up against legal issues here, but it still isn't a great idea for an industry that depends on being allowed to express themselves creatively. Another one, games get canceled for less. They shouldn't have made it this far to begin with. Signed and really hoping this doesn't hit the market. Writer and game designer, quality assurance, Square Enix. Done. Solidarity Comrade, Community Manager, EA, EA Play. And then we get a little bit of the pushback. Eric Kane, you might have read him doing some articles in Forbes, did an article on his own Substack that I think you should check out. It talks a lot about some of the problems that he sees with this, not identical with mine, but he has articles entitled The Ridiculous Censurious, I don't even actually know how to pronounce that one, Social Media Campaign Against Six Days in Fallujah. The war crime game, as we saw described by Kotaku, is the latest on the cancellation block. Maybe we should play it first? And that's really fundamentally one of the issues. We're going to talk about two separate issues here. The first of which is this notion that a petition was signed, and I only captured a few by hundreds, seemingly, of developers. I picked some of the bigger ones. A lot of indie developers, a lot of people representing Ubisoft. I think there might have been an Activision in there. Uh, there are a couple of people that are actually listed as making Rainbow Six Siege, if you can believe it, that come out and sign a petition that says this game will inevitably breed a new generation of mass shooters. Now, if you're a little bit younger, you might not realize the kind of fight that we've had about this in the video game industry. You might not realize how many times this has been discussed. I've talked about it here in Virtual Legality, about how one of the reasons I came to the law and to looking at statutes and the way senators and representatives thought about things was during the violence in video game Senate hearings in 1993, where they were looking at games like Night Trap and the original Mortal Kombat and games that you or I would not possibly think could drive violence in the users of those games. And yet they went out with absolute surety and made a farce out of all this. Now that was a coming of age moment for me in realizing exactly what senators knew and didn't know about what they were talking about. But what's most important about this particular argument is that it's not over. We've done virtual legalities recently about bills that are being proposed to potentially ban violent video games here, one in Illinois, that is absurd on its face and certainly violative of the First Amendment as it stands today, but not something that should just be thrown aside and said they don't ever have a chance of accomplishing something like this because government is the will of the legislature and the judiciary and the executive just allowing something to happen. And if you lose the minds of the Congress and the Roberts Court and the presidency, you're going to have a problem in your industry. Myopic. Myopic is what I've called it because you are creatives making violent video games very often. And still you are going out there and signing a petition with this kind of message. Now I've pulled up an article, Societal Violence in Video Games, Public Statements of a Link are Problematic. From December 2016, the Society for Media Psychology and Technology which talks about what you or I or anybody that regularly plays video games where you occasionally or often shoot someone already know. A wide body of research has examined the impact of violent video games on relatively minor acts of aggression, such as the administration of hot sauce, ice water, or bursts of white noise in laboratory experiments. Whether such studies provide conclusive evidence for a relationship between violent video games and these minor forms of aggression remains a matter of reasonable debate. And indeed, if you've ever seen, especially young boys in my experience playing a video game, you can tell that sometimes they get a little bit more rowdy, a little bit more rambunctious, depending on what kind of game they're playing. But even among members of the American Psychological Association Division 46 Society for Media Psychology and Technology, 
opinions regarding the impact of media violence on aggression differ considerably. This document focuses upon the less publicized, more scientifically sound view that little evidence exists that playing violent video games produces violent criminal behavior. Scant evidence has emerged that this debate uncovers, predicts what background elements lead to violence in society. By contrast, research evidence available to date indicates that violent video games have minimal impact on violence in society. Indeed, violent video games have been around long enough that we actually have a generalized societal case study, that we know that things haven't gotten to the point where Rick Hogue, because he's played a number of Grand Theft Auto games, is out there being violent to various 7-Eleven folks or out there shooting up and trying to get five-star police responses. It hasn't happened because it's not the way media and video games works. That's a good thing. We should be happy that these video games can exist and that they can entertain folks and that it doesn't wind up in significant societal harm. But when you've got game developers, the folks that make these games, going out with an argument like this, signing a petition like this, some politician might well grapple on and say, well, you know, the actual developers themselves believe this about the games that they are making. The actual developers at EA and at Square Enix and at Ubisoft and at WB have signed on to a statement like this inevitably. They didn't even give it a question, House Committee, Senate Committee, whatever it might be. We have to take this under advisement. The ESRB isn't doing its job, and now we can lay at the feet of video games, video games that you or I love that this is a problem that needs to be addressed because look, they said it themselves. They signed on to this document, myopic. Now, I also mentioned that we'd come back and talk about the restraint of trade kind of concept, right? Everybody that's on the internet likes to be an armchair lawyer. I don't blame them. Certainly this looks untowards, right? And we've talked about the Sherman Act and virtual legality in the past. And the Sherman Act in general says, if you have a contract, a combination or conspiracy, which is essentially an arrangement among people, in restraint of trade, you're in trouble. Or if you monopolize things and you use that power to hurt others, you're in trouble. I think people would generally think that this might be a restraint of trade, but there are problems with that. The first of which is these folks, they aren't WB Games. They aren't Ubisoft. They aren't Square Enix. They aren't Activision. They aren't whoever else might appear on this list. These are individuals. And one of the highest pieces of law in the United States is that First Amendment. Osama Dorius is fully within his rights to have an opinion on this game, to seek to have this game banned, to book burn on six days in Fallujah. We can criticize for him. We can criticize anybody else that signs this petition and say, this is not something that should be done. We should allow art to exist and we should judge it on its merits after it's released. But he is well within his rights and the government isn't going to throw him in jail isn't going to penalize him, isn't going to charge him fines. Now, it could be the case that WB Games or Ubisoft or Square Enix or Activision pulls one or more of these people into the office and says, do you understand what we do here? Do you understand how we make money? Do you understand how this makes us look? Do you understand that the U.S. government right now is very excited about harming technology companies? And whether or not you agree with that is a completely separate topic than this video, but it's worth noting that the U.S. government currently embroiled in filing antitrust suits against everybody in evaluating Facebook and Google and Twitter and everything else would be more than happy to bring video games up for a hearing again. They just had loot box hearings throughout all of the last two years. They think that big, huge swaths of the video game industry are essentially con artists that are trying to steal money from people using gambling mechanics and psychological tricks, and that if they can regulate them further, they should. This opens the door to that, but it isn't illegal because there is a distinction between the entities and the people themselves. Now, you can get into situations where a employer can be charged with the liability of one of their employees. I've pulled up Michigan law because that's where I'm at, but many of these states are going to have similar concepts. Under Michigan law, an employer's vicarious liability under the doctrine of respondeat superior, we love Latin, is as follows. A master, pardon the language, this is how it's used in the law, is responsible for the wrongful acts of his servant, committed while performing some duty within the scope of his employment, but is not vicariously liable for acts committed by its employees outside the scope of employment because the employee is not acting for the employer or under the employer's control. 
I think there can be little doubt that the WB Games executives don't want their people going out with this, or even if they are sympathetic to somebody going out with this, they don't, as an entity, want to start fighting these other entities that make video games, because then you do start to get into a conversation about whether or not you are engaged in restraint of trade. The other concept I've seen brought up by a number of people is this notion of group boycotts. It's described on the FTC page. It's as follows. Any company may, on its own, refuse to do business with another firm. There's no obligation to do business with another. But an agreement among competitors not to do business with targeted individuals or businesses may be an illegal boycott, especially if the group of competitors working together has market power. Example, the FTC has challenged the actions of several groups of competing healthcare providers, such as doctors, charging that their refusal to deal with insurers or other purchasers on other than jointly agreed upon terms amounted to illegal boycotting. But that's not what's happening here. It would look a lot more like group boycotting if it were actually Ubisoft and actually Respawn and actually EA that went to someone like GameStop and said, we're not going to sell you our games if you keep that game on the shelf. That starts to look a little bit more like what this is talking about. But we don't have Respondiat Superior. We don't have Vicarious Liability. We don't have the entities acting on their own. And it's too sporadic to assume that they all got together in some dimly lit cabal chamber and told their employees to go out with this because they were so worried about six days in Fallujah. So from a legal perspective, and I know a lot of people on the internet are talking about this, it strikes me as enormously unlikely that there is a cause of action under the antitrust laws for what you see happening. Instead, it just looks terrible and should be called out because it's silly and myopic for video game developers to seek to boycott the creative output of other video game developers because it's only a short jump away from the government turning on this. Yes, we talked about murder and we talked about violence in video games, but just in general, if your petition seeks to protect the children because of all this, don't be surprised if the next government hearing says, well, okay, WB Games Montreal, aren't you making a game where you viciously beat people as a vigilante, unbeholden to the police and legal system, and you actually are aiming your product at kids? Please explain yourself. That's the kind of thing that happens. From the Ubisoft perspective, you make this game, Rainbow Six Siege, and you're going to come after another for being too violent and for inevitably creating mass shootings. This is a mirror image to what we saw in 1993. It's a mirror image to what we saw in the 1980s, whether from the right or the left. Groups of people deciding that whatever media they don't like has all these negative outcomes for these individuals that are otherwise incapable of controlling themselves. Dungeons and Dragons will lead to Satan worship. Harry Potter should be stricken from bookshelves because it teaches magic and moves kids away from God. Rainbow Six Siege creates problems of its own. In fact, Tom Clancy products have had discussions in governments about whether they were okay or not in the past. And right now, in the shadow of a government that is very excitable and very ready to regulate all forms of technology, this kind of thing is absolutely unfathomable to me. I don't have a strong desire to play Six Days in Fallujah. I doubt it will be a good game. But there is nothing worse than actually being in a position to make content for yourself, asking to have other people's content banned, and the worst, the biggest issue at the end of all of this is this thing isn't even out yet. You've decided if you've signed this petition what this thing is. You've decided that only one side of an issue is presentable and that this game doesn't present the side you would want even though you haven't played it, even though you haven't seen it. And I have only one thing to say to that. As I tweeted out yesterday, it's always odd to see someone go straight to the book burning arguments even before release. Could it be terrible and offensive? Think it could be. Absolutely. I am totally amenable to someone coming in and saying the game is going to be terrible, Rick. It's going to be offensive. It's going to glorify war crimes. Could. Might. Could it be thoughtful and introspective though? I think anybody that's honest with themselves looks at those facts, looks at those interviews and says, yeah, there's a possibility. If we want to have honest conversations, if we want the video game industry and the art form to continue to grow, then talking about controversial things 
is a part of that process. Movies have been doing it for a long time. Books have been doing it for even longer. And yes, there's an interactivity aspect of video games, but maybe, just maybe, we could learn a little bit more about a subject in history, about how we as a society function, about how we as players interact with both of those two things if we allow the art to exist. And yeah, when it comes out, if it's terrible, if it's offensive, slam it, give it a zero, have the conversation, but don't burn the books. Don't kill the art. Hard to know about whether something's going to be good if you prejudge. I think there really should be a word for that. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this, we're talking about the business and law of video games and occasionally, I guess, the culture of the video game industry. A lot on this channel, as well as on pop culture, music, movies, television, and more. We've got a Patreon. Please do check it out. We've got Streamlabs. We've got shirts. We've got mugs. we got all that good stuff because every little bit of help from the community that has helped support this channel is so appreciated. And I just can't believe how much support we've gotten already. But if none of that appeals to you, Best thing you can do, just subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, leave a comment for YouTube, and tell your friends that we're having these conversations. Some days we get a lot of subscribers, some days we don't get any. YouTube is a mysterious and dark Byzantine animal, but if you tell your friends, that's one way we know we can get a few more eyeballs on these conversations, and I think they're worthwhile conversations to have. If you saw this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching, and if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening, and I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.